hope is that it becomes an opportunity to raise the bar on data literacy. If nothing else, that it gets people to start like at least recognizing that there are issues and problems and challenges in the underlying data and data collection and things like that. I'm sitting down today with Amanda McCulloch. And Amanda, I wanna to talk to you about a couple things. So I wanna to talk to you about your work at Excella, your work with DataViz DC, your work with the Data Visualization Society. You have leadership positions in a lot of different groups, so I wanna hear all about what those groups do and what you do. And then I wanna switch gears and talk to you about visualizing COVID-19 data because I think you have a little bit of a unique background among other people working in DataViz and you have more of an insight, I think, than the typical person visualizing data right now. So I want to get some, some tips from you about visualizing that data. Okay, so Amanda, okay. welcome. Thank you. So start by telling me about your current work now. Tell me about Excella and what you do there. So I currently work as the data visualization capability lead for Excella. We're a consulting firm based out of Arlington, Virginia. For those not familiar with DC geography, that's just across the bridge from Washington, DC. Uh, we are a technology consulting firm. We work on full stack software development. We do work in agile. We do work in all these different spaces, but a big part of our work is in data and analytics. So I'm the data viz lead. I also have counterparts who lead the practices in data analysis data science and data engineering. And I really love our, our firm because we think about those different disciplines a little bit differently and think about how we can create these cross-functional teams with people who are say experts in standing up data pipelines. We all know how messy it can be to work with the underlying data before we can even make a visualization. And then thinking about how we go ahead and do great front end visualization work. So in my current work, I work for, with everyone from the CDC and working in the public sector over to working with big Fortune 100 companies. You've been there a few years already, right? Oh, three years. It's been almost three years in July, which is a bit crazy to think about because I, I still remember kind of making the leap from working in my previous role, which was more in the global health and development space, mm -hmm. over into working more in the private sector. And it's been a really interesting kind of transformational learning experience for me to see not just different ways data and tech gets used, but different ways that projects get managed. I've learned a lot more about agile processes, agile software development, and thinking about how some of those same practices actually apply to when we're building different analytical applications like dashboards for our different clients. So tell me next about DataViz DC, which we're recording this in April 2020, so I know <laughs> there's no in-person you know, professional societies meeting right now, mm -hmm. but that's a group that I've gone to a few of their events, but maybe not everybody's heard of them, especially people who aren't from the DC area like we are. DataViz DC is part of the broader data community DC group. It's a 501c3 nonprofit that includes a number of different meetups on different areas, kind of like the different Excella areas, right? So we have a data science meetup, we have a data ops, we have data engineering, but DataViz DC focuses on bringing people together from various different disciplines. So we have graphic designers, we have software developers, we have people who are just interested in data visualization. And we try to host a monthly meetup where we bring people together to either do a hands-on workshop or go ahead and hear from speakers or even have panels talking about careers more like some of what we're talking about today and it's a great way to connect with people in the DC area we've got over 8,000 members on our list I'm gonna guess that some of those don't live in DC anymore but I like to think that they still get some value from seeing some of the slides and the content from the talks that we do now in all of your spare time <laughs> you are also involved in the data visualization society so tell us all about dvs and specifically about your role and what types of leadership opportunities you've really stepped up to the plate to get started uh, with that group i will say i am I'm much more knowledgeable about the irs's 501c3 paperwork nowadays thanks to my role with dvs uh, i am the operations director for the DataViz society um, i stepped in and was one of the founding board members not the founders the founders are our triumvirate of amy cecil molly pettit and elijah meeks uh, but stepped in back when I was actually on maternity leave last year in April. Uh, and I think a little bit desperate for some human connection to someone who was I mean, older than two months old and could talk a little bit more back with me about my professional interests in different areas. 
So Data Viz Society is focused on bringing people together across the world. We're a global professional organization for Data Viz practitioners at any level. So we have over 12,000 members, maybe 13,000 now, who have joined us from more than 130 different countries around the world. And we communicate and connect through Slack, through email, through fireside chats that we're hosting right now with panels of Data Viz experts, giving you a chance to connect with different people on different topics in this crazy COVID-19 time. And it's a great space for actually bringing together different disciplines. Instead of focusing on one tool or tech stack, we instead said, how do we bring together the people who are individually engaged with the Tableau user groups, the Power BI user groups, the R user groups, the graphic designers? How do we bring all those people together? And how do we create a space for people early in their career or looking to change careers and do data visualization as their full-time job? How do we create a space for them to learn and grow and share best practices. While we use different tools and technologies and different data viz disciplines and roles, I think there are so many cross-cutting best practices that once you learn and master them in one tool, it's really easy to think about how they are used and are applied in other spaces. So DVS tries to create that central space to bring people together and really advance the data viz, the data viz discipline as a practice profession. I think 10 years ago when I finished grad school, I couldn't have guessed that this could be my full-time job <laughs> and I could wear as many hats as I do in the data viz world. Uh, but now I think it's really exciting because there are a lot better pathways into data visualization, learning paths, tools, different things. And DVS tries to connect people and tries to make those one-on-one -on -one and personal connections for people interested in this space. Are you hosting the fireside chat this afternoon? I am not. Well, I, technically, Excella is hosting the fireside chat. They've generously offered their Zoom webinar license for us. Um, I hosted last week's chat on visualizing public health data responsibly. And all of the recordings from those chats from public health, from our color theory chat, are all available on the Data Viz Society website. So you can check those out if you want to and see the recordings. Um, but the mapping one this afternoon will be a, a fun debate between different people in different camps of how we use maps to communicate information. That has a really good, I know you're not hosting that one. Uh, with your work in global public health and mapping, I mean, oh my goodness. Oh. Well, in all your spare time, hop on that. I'm going to participate and ask them some juicy questions. Too. Oh, good. Yeah, grill, grill, grill Elijah and Alberto and Kenneth and everyone about the different ways in which they like or don't like proportional symbols. <laughs> yeah, those have become a very hot topic in this land of how we visualize data about COVID-19. Oh, is that what they're debating? The symbol maps? I hope so. Uh, they will talk symbol maps. They will talk choropleth maps. They will talk best practices and when to use them or not use them. Uh, I think it'll be an interesting conversation. And I've heard a promise that Alberto is showing up with a beer. So okay. <laughs> he's ready for an informal chat. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk to you specifically, speaking of public health data and speaking of the Data Viz Society, and they have their Nightingale uh, uh, publication on Medium. Mm -hmm. About a month ago, March 2020, you published an article called 10 Considerations Before You Create Another Chart About COVID-19. So we'll link to the article, you know, along with this video so people can read the whole thing. But I want to mostly ask, what is, if you had to narrow it down from your 10 to just one, what is the most important consideration people need to keep in mind? Or several. I know, I know narrowing it down from 10 to 1 is, is a little bit unfair, but what should people keep in mind before they're visualizing COVID-19 data? So let's kind of hit that from a few different layers, because I think there are different points in which we make decisions about how and what we visualize and then what we publish and share. What are we creating and doing more for our own exploration and understanding? And what are we doing so that we can share it with the public to help other people make sense of information? So I would say, uh, one, uh, consider the fact that even though the data sets are very accessible now through initiatives with John Hopkins and Tableau and other groups that are making these quick, easy to analyze data sets publicly accessible, just because that data is there doesn't mean that data is high quality data. There are so many issues and challenges with the different ways that say uh, COVID-19 cases are counted in different states or in different countries. Mm -hmm. Are we including only cases that have been laboratory confirmed with a swab test that came back positive or also including probable cases or diagnostically confirmed cases? And how those cases are counted are very different in some cases across the different states 
and across different countries. So it's really hard to kind of make these apples to apples comparisons as easy as it might seem because that data is so accessible. So one, I would say, if you're going to dabble in COVID-19 data in some way, or if you have to, because it's part of your job working in public health or economics or somewhere else, try to really understand how the data gets collected so that you have a firm understanding of what that process looks like and why there might be issues with the accuracy, timeliness, or completeness of those data sets. So first, and it's a great practice always, make sure you understand how the data got collected. Just because it's there as a nice, shiny, analyzable table doesn't mean that it's something that you shouldn't try to understand the underbelly of. I think the second thing to consider is in your choices around how you analyze and design different visualizations, be mindful that the data that we have is really incomplete. The case data is really a function of how many tests are being done. And as a result, where we have more certainty on the death counts, um, deaths are also a function of cases, right? And so we have to think about the fact that we're, we have a lot of cases not represented in that data. And we're seeing that come out more and more in some of the retroactive reporting being done around countries that are farther along in their epidemic curves. So remember that there's a lot of uncertainty in that data. And the hardest part is that it's not uncertainty we can necessarily represent visually really well, because we can't always quantify that uncertainty. I've seen some different researchers, like there's a team out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, trying to use some different methods for estimating what share of cases we're actually capturing in different countries. When you start digging into that and seeing really low numbers with wide confidence intervals for the share of cases we even know, it really reinforces the uncertainty in the underlying data. And I would say that then, if you're going to go ahead and plot those numbers and start to make those comparisons, Make sure that, again, you're considering the ways in which your visualizations could be misinterpreted or misused. One of the common comparisons I've seen in some cases is comparing COVID-19 to flu. And I think we've seen that in a lot of kind of common media and journalism talking about this. And early on, even public health folks were trying to make sense of this disease by trying to see, like, is this better? Is this worse than, more impactful than the flu? And so as we look at that, how do we go ahead and make sure that we're making better, again, apples to apples comparisons? When we look at how we collect data on the flu in the US, we have routine, very like structured reporting systems for that disease. We have better quality data about that disease. We have a, a disease that kind of comes in seasonal, seasonally, um, but we kind of understand what that seasonality looks like. We don't know that about COVID-19. So if you're comparing, say, flu cases from March between in the US between COVID-19 and the flu and comparing case counts, we're in a very different point of that epidemic curve for COVID-19. And it really isn't an apples to apples comparison. We need a whole year of quality data to start to make those comparisons. So be cautious in how you start to tr try to create those reference points, which I know sometimes help us enable understanding, but can also mislead. And I know I've gone on for more points than you offered me with one, but I would close with saying that you should remember that every single case and every single death represents a person. And as we visualize and think about health related data, Thinking about that fact that each of those cases and each of those deaths represents a person and their story makes it really important to be thoughtful and mindful about how we're presenting that information. And that can come down even to things like color choices. Those red big bubble maps drive me a little bit bonkers because at the end of the day, they can be hard to interpret because of overlapping circles. But the color choices also just create such a visceral, angry, sad response for me that I hope we can be thoughtful in the ways our visualizations can create emotional response especially when visualizing such sensitive data. Great advice. I love that you add the humanity to it and keep that in mind. I think that's so critical. Amanda, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to get in touch? So I would love to have you join the Data Visualization Society. You can check out our website, datavisualizationsociety.com slash join to link up. And you can always find me there on our Slack workspace. Excitingly enough, thanks to Slack's generosity, we have a full Slack workspace without any message limits for the next three months. So this is the time to join and go ahead and check out all the past great conversations that have happened over on Slack. Um, I would say second, uh, the best place to follow me and stay up to date and stay in touch is on Twitter. I tweet a lot right now about uh, public health and data visualization, but I do that in my regular kind of day to day because that's that intersection of space that I live and I work in. So I would love to connect with folks on Twitter at AB McCulloch. Uh, would love to connect with you there and learn more about what other people are doing and thinking about and, and talking about around how we make sense of this pandemic when there's so much uncertainty in that data and information. All right, thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks, Anne.